So yeah, we have Kristen Kagetsu uh, here with us today. She's joining us from New York. So it's a bit late, uh, late evening for her. So if she's, uh, if she's a little bit sleepy, we, we, know, we know why. Um, and Kristen and Earth Company first uh, were acquainted a few years ago. Um, she actually applied to Impact Hero 2018 or 2019, um, if, I, if I remember correctly. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't select her back then. Um, but what I really remember was actually she uh, responded uh, right away to our decision saying, well, thank you um, for your consideration. I actually would like feedback on my application. And I remember from that batch, she was probably the only one that asked for that kind of feedback. And we were very, um, yeah, we were really surprised that, you know, someone who was turned down was actually coming for feedback. And so we did provide feedback. And then she applied again uh, last year. And then, of course, we remembered her. Uh, and then we were really um, inspired by the progress that her company has made over the last few years. I mean, I think the you know the idea of a biodegradable uh, menstrual pads it's some um, is is really truly uh, remarkable. Uh, something that we really hope that can be scaled up to the rest of the world. And so, yeah, and I think Kristen, as a, as a leader, as a as a social entrepreneur, I think breaks down a lot of barriers uh, and is a really inspiring uh, person. Uh, as you'll hear from her shortly, she's she's not she's quite soft spoken. She's not like the, the, the loudest, most passionate, uh, you know, in your face kind of social entrepreneur. Um, and she also, you know, graduated from MIT. Um, and I think that itself is an amazing story for a for, for women to have graduated from, from the best, you know, science university in the US or if not the world and to be, you know, embarking on this social entrepreneurship journey. I think that itself uh, is, is a truly remarkable story. So there's a, uh, yeah, I re I'm really looking forward to this session. Uh, and Kristen, thank you for sparing time with us. Welcome. Thank you so much. Sorry about that earlier. I forgot that I have two devices and one was on mute. Um, okay, so I guess hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, and I guess I'll get started. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of how sustainable menstruation led to us developing a model for sustainable manufacturing. And I know that has a lot of um, kind of like buzzwords in it, but uh, we'll, we'll break it down and we'll kind of go through um, different parts of what we were uh, looking at, what we were tackling, some of the issues we were trying to address and um, how we got to uh, where we are today with what we do at Zati. Um, yeah, so oops. So this is just a short little, um, hopefully it's not, um, hopefully the video is not blocking the, um, the slides. I don't know, for me it's blocking, but hopefully for you guys, you can see it. Um, but there's a sh short little kind of comic here. Um, maybe I'll give you a moment to read it or I'm happy to also uh, read through it if the text is too small. So just let me know. So it's just a kind of short story of like um, kind of gaining confidence and, um, you know, as a young girl going to school and, and being uh, kind of facing a period for the first time, not necessarily knowing what it is, especially if you weren't kind of uh, taught that um, as part of a health class or that sort of thing. So um, trying to break the taboo around menstruation as a whole. So just a tiny bit about me, um, as, as Tomo mentioned, uh, thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, I was born and raised in New York City. Um, I went to college in Boston. I studied mechanical engineering. Uh, and then I worked in Boston for a couple of years um, at a hardware uh, engineering company. 
And then I um, worked for a national nonprofit um, that was focused on engineering leadership. And then I moved to Andabad uh, about seven, no, almost seven years ago. Um, and I uh, moved to Andabad to, to start uh, Sati. And um, at Sati, we make biodegradable and compostable sanitary pads uh, that are from banana and bamboo fiber. And I'll go into a lot more about Sati itself later, but I um, kind of wanted to start a little bit um, on covering, we'll cover a couple different topics here today, um, the issues that we're addressing, so including period poverty, plastic pollution, um, what is sustainable menstruation, what we do at Sati, and then talking a little bit kind of to wrap it up in terms of what is circular economy um, and how we think of a uh, model for the future of, of um, you know, how our kind of business fit fits in the circular economy in the future. So uh, let's start with the issues. So the first, um, the first uh, kind of three issues that we are working to address are around um, health, so body, uh, community, social impact, and then the environment. Um, so in terms of health, about 60% of women experience UTIs in their lifetime, about 70% suffer from um, reproductive, uh, these are UTIs are urinary tract infections and RTIs are reproductive tract infections. Um, and both women in rural and urban areas are facing um, rashes and irritation due to the plastics and chemicals in regular sanitary pads that also uh, contain a lot of 90% uh, plastic. Um, and then if we look at the community or the kind of social impact, um, almost 23 million girls uh, in India drop out of school annually. This is not only due to lack of access to menstrual hygiene products, but, but it is one of the contributing factors. So we understand that as a, as a whole, as a system, uh, this can be uh, just one factor that can help to reduce the um, dropout rates in schools and also um, help women stay in, at, uh, in um, work out as well. Uh, the third area is the environment. So only 36% of women in India use sanitary pads. And um, this is also like a very small number, but if you think about the majority of the population in India also lives in rural areas, it kind of maps to that same um, demographic. And uh, looking at that, um, you know, with the majority of sanitary pads being made today, uh, made out of plastics and um, chemicals like bleach and that have the accents and that sort of thing, um, how, you know, how can we address lack of access, but also provide a product that's not going to create a plastic pollution or waste problem. So that's kind of the three areas that we're looking to address. So First thing is, uh, what is period poverty and, and why is it important? And throughout, there's a number of different questions and you're welcome to kind of put your thoughts in the, in the comment, uh, in the chat box as we go along. Um, but basically in terms of uh, period poverty, like if you look at the definition by the UNFPA, it's describing the struggle of how many uh, low-income women are facing um, uh, issues affording menstrual hygiene products. And um, this also extends to not just affording them, but also the consequences that it has on the lives of women and girls. So again, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the ability to um, stay in school, um, stay at work or, or attend work, right? Uh, if you don't have um, any uh, sanitary pads or menstrual cups or other um, options, uh, the alternative is basically um, rags. And in many cases, these rags are um, not hygienic because they're not uh, dried outside in the sun. And so they can, uh, can um, uh, harbor bacteria. And that's kind of where some of the issues lie. And also there are other alternatives like bark and ash and, and that sort of thing. So how can we provide a better alternative um, and at the same time um, reduce uh, the um, plastic waste. So how widespread is plastic waste and why is that important? So again, looking at some of the facts, like uh, we, I think, have all heard now about, um, you know, initiatives like reducing use of plastic straws. And so that's kind of one very easy thing for people to kind of jump on because they know oh yeah, I use plastic straws every time I go and get a coffee. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, plastic straws are just one of the items, the plastic items, single use plastic items that are polluting our um, environment, our oceans, our uh, land, et cetera. And 
um, one of the things is um, that with plastic pollution, um, once you create those single-use plastics and put them, uh, you know, for consumers to use, then it's very difficult to recover those, especially because you know only fifteen percent of plastic waste is recycled, um, and and not all plastic waste can be recycled, uh, and so then it ends up becoming um, microplastics, basically. So. Plastics take 600 to 800 years to degrade, first of all. And when they degrade, they're becoming just tiny little pieces of plastic, so microplastics. And, and those microplastics end up in the land that our food grows in, or it ends up in the ocean. Uh, and you know, uh, marine life eats it. And if we happen to eat those uh, fish from the ocean, then we end up eating it. And recently, there was a study that actually showed that there's the first evidence of microplastics in human placenta. And so this is kind of the state of where uh, plastics have uh, you know, cycled through and have uh, come back to nearly become basically part of us. Um, and so this is something we need to uh, kind of where health and sustainability meet. This is kind of the intersection of that. So if we talk about what is sustainable menstruation. Um, so again, looking kind of at um, just kind of fact checking here, but, uh, you know, there's um, annually a 12 point uh, 2 billion pads are disposed, and the majority of those are, are not biodegradable. And each pad is 90% plastic, and these are, are, are non-recyclable um, plastics. They're, they're just uh, single use. And so um, if you look at some of the materials that are in regular sanitary pads, um, you know, some of the chemicals that keep it clean, so bleach, for example, right, that they put enough bleach in it so that it doesn't contain bacteria um, and it can last on the shelf and all of that, which is great. But then at the same time, that bleach um, contains dacs and impurities and these things, especially if waste is burned, which in many places, uh, in order to get rid of the waste, if we don't have enough landfill space, then the waste will be incinerated. And when you incinerate the waste, you release all of these toxins into the air which we then breathe. So it kind of comes back to us um, regardless. And if you look at um, kind of the environmental aspects, so this is just breaking it down into kind of the three aspects of water, air, and land. And so for water, right, uh, again, the, the plastics that we have, when they start to break down over time naturally, um, they will degrade, but not they're not biodegradable because they are not turning back into any organic matter. They're just becoming smaller pieces of plastic, which um, will then uh, just kind of, they don't break down uh, because they're very complex uh, molecules. And so they just become part of the, the water and the air we breathe um, and, and the land as well. Um, so what are some of the options? So there's two options that we provide um, as of today. One is biodegradable sanitary pads, and there are a couple others um, that you probably might have heard of uh, um, in terms of, you know, there are multiple options basically for, for um, you know, looking for sustainable menstrual products, right? And this, this is just one example, but I mean, generally we try to promote um, uh, different methods for sustainable living. So that's kind of one of the things we try to talk about a lot, especially on our social media platforms. Um, but if we kind of zone into what is sustainable menstruation, so it's looking at different products and options for having a sustainable period. And basically, um, what are some of the products available and some of the things that you can look out for um, to be a more educated consumer, basically, um, because, you know, you're going to look for what, what is available for you and um, that makes a lot of sense, of course, Sati is not, unfortunately not available in every country just yet, so um, we're, we're working towards that uh, hopefully someday, but um, at the moment, uh, so what, what kinds of things do you want to keep in mind? Um, so when someone says that they're providing a biodegradable product, uh, one of the products that was launched um, in India was an oxo-biodegradable product, and basically um, one of the issues with an oxo-biodegradable product is that though it has biodegradable in the name and it says OXO, so OXO, it means that it breaks down when it's exposed to air. 
And one of the issues with an oxobiodegradable product is actually this is a kind of plastic, which um, it's, it's the same plastic molecules that you would get from regular plastic, but what they've done is they put an additive that breaks it down when it's exposed to air. So it just kind of um, breaks apart the molecules into smaller pieces of plastic. Um, and, you know, unlike when you go with a metal detector through the beach and you can collect up all the little pieces of metal, there's no plastic detector which will just um, pick up all the little pieces of plastic. So once you break it into these little tiny pieces of plastic, uh, you cannot collect them. And that's part of the um, issue with, with microplastics that we're facing now. Um, another option is, is a menstrual cup. And so, a lot of people probably have heard of this recently, especially because there's more news about it, but a menstrual cup is also another sustainable option. And basically with menstrual cups, um, they are insertable. So there's a different um, use, uh, like user experience basically with this product. And so that's kind of one of the things is if you look at sustainable menstruation, right? There's maybe about five different types of products these days. Um, but if you think about like all the choices that you have when you go to the store and you walk down the aisle to look at toothbrushes, combs, and all those other personal hygiene products that you have, uh, to have more options in sustainable menstruation is really um, necessary because not every person has the same body shape or body type. And each of these options may or may not work for different people. So I think that's one of the things we try to talk a lot about is, uh, you know, you want to find the one that fits right for you and your, um, and your body. And, and so right now we have two options. And of course, basically anything that's not the plastic options that are available today are, are good options in our book. So um, it's all kind of about thinking about it, uh, experimenting, choosing what suits you best, um, but definitely kind of trying to talk a bit more about it so that um, we can break the taboo and, and have people have more um, better experience with their periods, but also um, have more options as well. So now we'll go into a little bit about what we do at Sati. Um, so bringing back the slide from earlier where we talked about the problems and issues that we're trying to address, just a quick refresher, but um, we're looking at addressing issues related to health, the community, and the environment. And if we look at, um, uh, if we look at kind of the products that, that we have, we're looking at building a more holistic solution. So we want to make products that are chemical free, plastic free, uh, that they're accessible to the community and um, they don't uh, have any harm on, on our environment. Um, and we're able to do this with uh, proprietary technology. So we're able to convert our um, agri-waste raw materials into an absorbent material. And that allows us to make um, the sanitary pads that we have today, as well as other products in the future. This is kind of an overview of our business model in, in the sense of like how, um, how it works. So we start uh, on the top left with the, um, the raw materials, and, or sorry, we start, start on, the, on the right side with the raw materials and we're able to um, basically source them from farmers. So we buy the, the stems and raw materials from farmers and they're discarding them. So it's already uh, a waste and we're able to provide additional income. We have an all women staff in our manufacturing unit and we produce the pads in our factory. Uh, and then we're able to sell them both to women in urban and rural areas. Um, and everything is uh, from pads to packaging is biodegradable. And so this is a, is a cycle that we're trying to create with um, kind of how we look at the life cycle of the product. In terms of our revenue model, we have kind of two streams. So we look at both B2B and B2C. Uh, so B2C, we have our own websites as well as other um, e-commerce and other platforms as well. In terms of B2B, we work with corporates and we work with NGOs. Um, so we are able to provide plastic credits um, to corporates and other partners, uh, as well as work with NGOs to distribute the pads to the women that need it most. One of the things that we've been doing since day one is, is measuring our impact. And this is 
uh, very popular now, uh, but I think one of the things that we have looked at is how we map to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there are 17 goals, but uh, we map to at least eight of them, um, most directly at least, and uh, we're looking at um, kind of how we can make improvements. So this is kind of our what we've done so far, as well as our goals for the next five years, and where we can where we can see a lot of um, improvement over time. So as I mentioned, kind of all of these impacts are built into our business model, so that as we grow, all of our impacts will grow. So, for example, um, we are working with uh, farmers to provide additional income to the farmers, but we're also getting our raw materials from them. So that's, this is very much built into, uh, you know, as the demand of our product increases, then we can buy more raw materials. In addition, as we produce more product, we can employ more women. So we have an all women staff in a manufacturing unit, and we're able to kind of increase that staff capacity as we increase the size of our manufacturing unit. Then in terms of the health side, so we're providing um, these products both to women in urban and rural areas. And so um, all the pads that we sell in urban areas is subsidizing pads for women in rural areas. And it's uh, essentially kind of a one-for-one -one model. And um, we work with NGOs very closely to make sure that the products get directly to uh, women who need to use them. One of the... And one of the ways that we do this is through our 1 million pads initiative. So uh, these are just a couple of the kind of pictures from our um, distribution uh, program and the um, some of the sessions that we ran with the women to also say like, uh, this is how to use a product. This is what, um, you know, menstruation is in, uh, because many women have not had like a kind of a um, uh, exposure to like what is the menstrual cycle from beginning to end. And so we've gone through kind of all of those basics as well. And uh, I, I won't go into too many of these details because, um, but, but we have basically uh, a number of different um, results from our um, program in, um, in Ranchi that we did. And so these are some of the um, improvements that you can see both uh, improved menstrual hygiene practices, uh, more positive health outcomes, um, increased social mobility and uh, lower environmental impact. Uh, so these are kind of all the, the different things that we were measuring as um, in that particular program um, that you can kind of see improvements in. Uh, and the final aspect is looking at the plastic waste reduced as well as the CO2 emissions reduced. So, um, because we're working in manufacturing, we are starting at the source. Uh, that's another thing that's very important to us. We start at the source of um, where the waste is being generated, because once waste is generated by some other third party manufacturer, then you have no control. You have to deal with the waste. Whereas if you are in the business of making products, then you know where do you get your raw materials? How do you make them? Uh, how do you make the products and what do you do if there's any like uh, things that don't need to be used during the production process. So we have a lot of ability to control how much waste we produce. Um, kind of going along with some of the outreach activities that we've done. So in addition to providing the product, um, the uh, other important aspect is outreach. So whether that's outreach in kind of urban areas, so we do outreach in, in urban areas of India as well as uh, outside of India. And these um, workshops are around uh, the same thing, kind of sustainable menstruation. What is it, um, what are some of the issues that we're addressing and um, how can basically everyone who attends the workshops be part of the, the solution? Um, and we've had a lot of opportunities uh, to kind of share the work that we've done outside um, of the um, outside of the kind of uh, so, uh, outside of our community, and uh, this kind of helps to uh, elevate um, the initiative and also to um, bring to attention to period poverty and and sustainability as well. Um, We've been really fortunate to have a lot of recognition by 
uh, some big uh, names like Time Magazine, uh, Fast Company, MIT Tech Review, and uh, Allure, and, and uh, Vogue, and that sort of thing. And um, we have basically been recognized kind of for the innovative, uh, social, socially impactful work, uh, as well as um, environmental work that we've done. But some of our best um, kind of, uh, even though we have a lot of uh, accolades, I guess you can say, um, some of the best moments are when we hear from customers, uh, some of the feedback that they've given us in terms of the product and how it's helped them or how it's improved uh, their experience. Um, and so we've seen a lot of different stories that uh, are really um, keep us going. So for the fourth part of uh, the talk, I want to talk a bit about uh, circular economy and um, sustainable manufacturing. So we'll start with um, kind of, again, looking at the UN SDG. So uh, SDG 12 is about responsible consumption and production. So one of the uh, quotes from the Global Goals website is that our planet has provided us with an abundance of natural resources, but we've not utilized them responsibly and currently consume far beyond what our planet can provide. We must learn how to use and produce in sustainable ways that will reverse the harm that we've inflicted on the planet. And so this is a very core part of um, uh, kind of what we do. And the sustainable goals were developed in 2015 and our company was kind of developed at the end of 2014. So we've been growing and seeing a lot more people kind of get on board with the, the UN SDGs. But I think this is something that um, uh, having learned more about the, the goals as, as we've grown, um, we really resonate with. And particularly looking at how it impacts um, India, um, which is where we're based. Uh, you know, you can see some of the, the statistics that only 15% of urban India's waste is processed and, um, you know, how, how much um, of an issue it already is, given uh, only 36% of women are using pads, right? So that's, a, again, a small percentage. So if we keep increasing the number of women using products, which is what we want to do, how are we going to address the waste issue on the flip side? So if we look at, like, what... Um, Kind of what's the difference between a linear and circular economy? So linear economies are just looking at everything from you know making the products, making the best products, of course, but focusing on just how do you make products and then get it to the consumer, and not really thinking about what is um, what is the um, end of life basically of the product. So just saying, okay, well, it's kind of that take and take, make and dispose culture basically. But if you look at, um, there's kind of two more iterations there. One is kind of a reuse economy. So one that's looking at how do you reuse some of the materials that are going out and recycle them, but there's still, there still could be waste in that system. And then the third is kind of the ultimate, which is a circular economy. So looking at not only how do we produce products, but how can we reuse? And one of the books that I, um, I was exposed to in, in college was uh, Cradle to Cradle. And that was kind of one of the first um, uh, uh, experiences of like reading a little bit more about what it would be like if we thought about all of our products with that mindset of how do we take our the products we are going to create and um, make sure that they can be either upcycled, reused or something else. Um, and as a mechanical engineer, very much interested in product design, that was uh, that kind of really hit home. So if we take another kind of viewpoint of what our, our business model looks like, um, our goal essentially is to take the, you know, again, every waste materials, use those to make our products, provide our products to both urban and rural areas, and then have them uh, be upcycled into various different uh, various different products, um, whether that's compost, biogas, or other things, uh, and and basically close the loop on um, on the product uh, life cycle itself. So uh, some of these different options include, you know, having kind of anaerobic and aerobic composting and bio toilets, uh, looking at biomass to energy systems, and really exploring like what are some of the ways that we can upcycle. And 
composting reduces um, waste that goes to landfills. It, it provides a nutrient rich uh, mixture for, for soil. Um, and it can be done even at home as well. So there's a short video that um, everyone can check out on YouTube, but it's basically uh, a sh uh, about five minutes and it's a, a little bit of the story and kind of the context of uh, what we're doing and, and the work that we do in India particularly. Um, but I think it kind of gives a nice uh, visual representation of, uh, of the talk that I've given today. Oops, uh oh, it's, it is starting. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, just to kind of wrap things up, we are looking for a couple of different things, um, strategic funding, distribution opportunities, corporate partners to work with us on both the upcycling side as well as, um, you know, if, if a company is looking for how to reduce the plastic uh, or how to kind of um, look, uh, look for plastic credits or carbon credits or that sort of thing, um, those are things that we can help with. We also do have internship opportunities if there are any uh, students that are looking for internships and they're in kind of all different areas, but uh, pretty much um, it gives exposure to social enterprise and what it's like to work in a, um, in a company that's working towards both women's health and sustainability. And these are just some of the women that we've worked with to date and we aim to make that millions more in the next couple of years. Thank you very much uh, for having me and inviting me to, to speak to everyone today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, that Christine. Was that was so good. Yeah, amazing stuff. I'm sure you're going to get internship applications left and right after this, especially once this is shared with the, with the Green School community. Cool. Maybe you can turn on, turn off the screen share so we can see you better. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. There was so much, so much there. Uh, any one slide could be, you know, discussed in in length. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was it was really good. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have questions, and Chris has already posted one question. So. I encourage you all to push your questions and then I'll try to give you airtime to ask your question in uh, on, on mic, uh, on video. But uh, maybe I'll start off with one or two questions to just get us started. First question is probably something that's on everyone's mind. When is Satipad coming to Indonesia? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. We are talking to a couple of people in Indonesia, so um but we are open to also any suggestions or recommendations for where you might want to see them <laughs> okay great yeah i know um there are a couple of people from this uh company called startup called perfect fit tunga and i saw shanina as well earlier uh they're actually working uh they have a menstrual pad uh, product here in indonesia maybe someone to talk to um yeah the and another question that I have is um, around the involvement of men. And I think that's a huge part of what you're, you do. And I guess I should try to apologize on behalf of the masculine part of the human race for not um, for being so ignorant and uh, for not providing support to, to this issue uh, for the last few decades or last even you know, few centuries. Um, but yeah, just on how are you involving, mobilizing, empowering men to be a greater, you know, contributor to, 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 to this, to this work? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's something, um, so we have engaged men through our workshops, actually. Um, I think sometimes they may... Uh, not know if it's like something that they should be part of, but we have encouraged um, and to be part of the workshops. Um, when we're at booths and events, we always uh, talk to men and women both, um, but sometimes 
the men or the boys that we've talked to who just run away and um, and while we're talking, so I think it's a it's about it's a matter of kind of making it um, like a non judgmental conversation, basically, and just talking to everyone um, uh, with an equal footing. Um, and at the same time, I think one of the things uh, that we have uh, also done is that a lot of uh, people who have joined our team at Sati are men um, because they tend to be in engineering, there's more men in engineering than women. And so though we would love to have more women on the team in engineering, that's just uh, the, there's just fewer of them that graduate that degree. So um, we have been able to kind of have more exposure that way as well. Right, it's awesome. Yeah, it's great to have so many men involved in your team. Yes. Okay, so maybe I'll ask Chris, do you want to come on mic to share your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Kristen. It's uh, I thank you, as I say to Tomo and Carol and everybody. Uh, I just think your your background. I mean, I love that you say you went to school in Boston. I don't think people know that you actually went to MIT. And just knowing your history and your background, and but I also find you probably the most humble and kind person that, uh, that I like I've sort of ever worked with or encountered in my, my 30 years of doing business. And I just think that's, a, that's such a great attribute of yours. And I hear it from others that interact with you. So thank you. And I know you're not great at probably taking these compliments, but I'm gonna give them to you. And, and I hope you please accept them. And uh, so my, my question, and it does tie to what Tomo was asking, but I'm really more specific <clears throat> about what's going on um, in India. I mean, are you finding resistance from the men in India around, around the topic? Um, and, uh, and also, I mean, I think we're all very, very aware of the brutal uh, rape culture that goes on in India and the and the, the domestic violence and the, um, the sexual violence that goes on there, which India is not obviously the only country in the world where that happens. It, I mean, it's prolific here in Bali. This is actually one of the worst places I've seen it anywhere in the world. But, um, but how are you, you know, you're, you have this focus on the sanitary pads and distribution. Are you able to align with some of these other issues and topics that are coming up? And then how are, men engaging in that topic. So thank you again. Wow, thanks. Um, I humbly accept your, your, um, uh, your compliments. And um, I think um, in terms of the, um, I mean, these are, these are big issues. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're just one, one of the players uh, in the space. And so um, we definitely want to to do our part. Um, I think it is something to, to note in terms of, um, uh, you know, we try to use our social media platform and presence uh, to, to talk about these issues and, and to bring attention to them um, and to, to start discussions about it. Um, I think it's also something where um, uh, I think you know, just having conversations with people is, is really where you have to start. Um, I think with, um, I guess, resistance uh, to, I would say that when we started, there was a lot more, or it was, it was more noticeable, the resistance that we, we saw because it, there was just um, fewer people that we had talked to. And so the people that happened to be in the seats of decision-making uh, were men and then they didn't quite understand what we were doing and there were less people in this space at that time. And so it was just a whole new world and, and basically they, they weren't as receptive, I would say. Um, but that applied to both men in India and men in the US too. Um, and it's just a matter of they were the ones sitting with the, with the decision-making power in terms of uh, accepting us into a program or uh, giving us, you know, grant funding or anything like that. And so there were definitely more barriers at that point. I think now there is a, at least a little bit more um, awareness in, in the media um, and it, there's still more to be done because uh, this is a huge issue. But um, 
uh, we do try our best to, to use our social media voice, um, even though it's relatively small in the grand scheme of things, but we do try to use it to, to raise awareness in, in at least the community that we reach. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen. I know, uh, Harriet, you have a lot of comments and questions. Um, do you want to share a little bit? Yeah, thank you. I had to keep checking I was muted because I was cheering and hollering and just so grateful to be in this uh, talk and to just hear the amazing work you're doing. And menstruation randomly became um, the probably the topic I talk about the most in both classes <laughs> and in conversation and I feel so grateful that Green School has given me the platform to to have those with young people and that was kind of what my question was about as a menstruator um, it's been something that's actually really unifying in our community is that I can be in a class talking about this topic and there are students that are also having a similar experience reaching out to the parent community but also knowing that when we open up a class it's we had 30 people all in a class about menstruation boys and girls all eager to learn about this topic so I feel that the resistance can shift with the upcoming generations if we keep having those conversations and platforms to do so but also knowing and I think anyone in the school knows that often you do when you're in need of a product it also builds relationships so you go like have you got anything have you got this so i did wonder how do you, does your company have um youth ambassadors or you know just thinking about some movements like the um, stand by her movement in china where students are handing out free sanitary products to each other looking at it in scotland there's something similar and at green school we have a menstruation mission where the students fill up those resources does your company have that connecting and how could how could um, that help your kind of global outreach as well? So lots of common questions, but hopefully that made sense. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, in terms of students, uh, definitely. Um, we have also spoken to high school and middle school students as well. And um, and I think it runs the gamut, right? You have you have the experiences of students kind of running away because they're they're embarrassed to talk about it or giggling and that sort of thing, and, and it kind of you, breaks your confidence for a minute. But at the same time, there are also the opposite stories as well. Like um, we've been to events where like the father will come up and say, "Oh, my daughter or my wife would love this," and um, you know they immediately like pick up uh, some of the products for them, or um, you know, or they or there are young boys that also want to talk. Uh, about oh what like you know how does it work and they're just curious um, and so I think there's just um, you know a, a, a lot of um, a lot of shift I think in the conversation now um, in terms of youth ambassadors we would love to have um, youth ambassadors I think it's something which um, you know we, we're working on quite a lot of things and so um, we haven't kind of built that out just yet but but I think that's something we'd love to have. Um, and happy to to chat about that if that's something of interest. Oh, I would love to chat about it. I know I know some young people that would love to talk about it as well. So, I'll, um, but thank you. That's awesome. Very exciting. Great. Yeah. Maybe maybe you can you guys can start a youth ambassadorship program after this call. That would be awesome. Um, Shuba, do you want to turn on your video and ask your question, if you can? Hi, thank you so much for that talk. And um, it's so, so inspiring what you've done and really, really wonderful. Um, the teacher in me has a question about the presentations that you actually gave. And um, I saw one of the topics was design thinking. And I was curious about um, why you were teaching that and um, what the uptake was and understanding comprehension was of the women that you were teaching to. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so we, we've done design thinking workshops. Uh, in the early days, it was kind of about the product itself. So we were curious to get feedback. And one of the ways we were able to do that was having kind of a design thinking format. So. Um, we would bring in a group of women and they would uh, be designing pads that they were interested in having with like, um, it kind of opened the conversation of, oh, what kind of, um, uh, what are some of the issues that you face with pads today? And what are some of the things that you'd like to see in, in your sanitary pad? 
I think at this point, one of the things that we're looking at um, with design thinking is also exploring like how we can kind of move the needle with um, uh, big corporates and that sort of thing. So how we can, uh, this is something that we'd like to explore a little more is, is working in design thinking in that front because they're kind of the decision makers of where all the resources are. And so if we can do design thinking at that level, it's creating more system change rather than just uh, focusing on kind of individuals because we only have so many resources. And um, we love to do um, workshops with individuals because it does make a difference. But at the same time, if we can kind of make that difference with um, uh, big corporates or with big big entities, then um, they can kind of help us move the needle a little faster. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Shuba, and good to see you on, on video, Shuba. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, at least three more questions from Melissa, Mai, and Tunga. I know we don't have that much time, so maybe we can try to go relatively quickly so we can get everyone um, to ask their question. So Melissa, do you want to ask your question? Or maybe, okay, well, we can see the question. So uh, I guess it's more of a specific question about the, the material. Uh, what materials do you use that enables to be compostable? Um, because it seems that it needs to be lined or wrapped in some sort of plastic. Yep. Uh, so basically what we use uh, for it to be compostable is banana fiber and bamboo fiber in the absorbent part. And then of course we do have a hydrophobic layer for the, um, for the bottom layer, but it's not plastic. We have been able to develop a material that's um, completely plant-based uh, for the bottom layer and the top layer as well. So that's kind of where our innovation and, and um, um, the time that we spent kind of doing more R&D has led us to those developments. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mai, do you want to ask your question, Mai? Sure. Um, um, could you share um, how did you manage to make the products affordable for um, you know many ladies? Because I know in India, the um, income level in rural areas is really low. So um, you know, what's your thoughts on that? And how did you manage to get your pets across the rural community? Thank you, and I love your work. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, um, in terms of getting our products uh, to be affordable, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we've done so far is we're using um, kind of uh, as many materials that we can that are um, uh, kind of um, compostable, biodegradable, but also easily accessible. Uh, at the same time, one of the things that will help to kind of bring down the cost over time is to scale up our manufacturing. So this is a volume-based product, so you just need to make it in larger volumes in order to be able to um, in order to bring down the price. But even still, if we look at um, our product compared to some other products in the market in India, um, probably part of the reason that we're able to, to be a little bit less is that we have made our product locally in India. We didn't import it. And so others have to pay like import duties and all of those things. Um, and then how do we make it accessible to women in rural areas? Well, we have that two-pronged model. So we, um, um, women who are buying the product in urban areas are subsidizing products for women in rural areas. Um, and at the same time, there are plenty of other ways that you know, CSR, other corporates also, are also interested to support more women. So we can kind of have the two-pronged approach. And to get the products as quickly and as directly to women who need it, we do partner with NGOs because they already have networks of women that they work with, um, whether it's for uh, kind of um, other issues like food, education, um, and that sort of thing. So we're able to tap into those networks and uh, instead of doing kind of like last mile distribution through retailers and that sort of thing. Um, so we're able to kind of skip over that. Right. It's, it's amazing how you guys like basically check off every box, right? It's like local production, it's circular economy, it's like gender, everything. You're like, yeah, truly amazing. Um, uh, Tunga, do you want to maybe share your comments? So Tunga is actually a former colleague, colleague of mine from Copernic. 
uh, and she started this uh, social enterprise called Perfect Fit, which is a spinoff of Copernic. And I'm actually having lunch with Tunga right after this. <laughs> um, so Tunga, do you want to share? Sure, Toma. Thank you so much. And uh, nice to virtually connect with you, Kristin. Uh, I'm Tunga uh, from Perfect Fit. So I'm a big fan of Sadi Path. So it's, it's very nice to finally be able to speak with you as we started the Perfect Fit uh, in 2018 uh, to improve menstrual health in Indonesia. Same issue with you, like we want to have affordable locally produced solution. So at the beginning, we were thinking to produce biodegradable pads, but the way to go there is very, very complicated. Uh, so we started with the reusable uh, cloth pad uh, with, with a local woman in East Nusa Tenggara province. And I found my patient there and I started uh, to, to leave my job at Copernic and decided to spin off the Perfect Fit as a startup end of uh, last year. So the same focus we do more on uh, increasing access to sustainable uh, solutions for menstruators while addressing the issue of uh, menstrual health, environmental sustainability and gender rights. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, first, I would love to speak with you more after this to explore collaboration in the future. And my question would be, uh, how, how's your go to market strategy for for women and girls in, in India? Because as uh, the previously uh, mentioned in the question, uh, India is almost the same like like Indonesia, like there's a huge disparity of, of the willingness to pay of the people and how, how do you grab the, the market with, with your product? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely would like to connect after. Um, I think in terms of what we um, have done, so, so because we have the two prong model, um, again, kind of being able to provide the products at a uh, subsidized rate in rural areas through the NGOs. Again, uh, by doing this um, kind of easing the burden on the end user. So um, women who are in, like who aren't able to pay, the NGO already knows like the capacity to pay. And so they can um, the, basically be able to subsidize the difference if required. And again, we try to work really closely with the NGO to make it, um, you know, the best rates possible. Um, at the same time, kind of on the uh, urban side, how do we get to our consumer? Uh, it's through social media, word of mouth, um, sharing our, our products um, as much as possible online so that people can find out about us. Um, and yeah, just having, um, uh, those kind of social media promotions that um, help us reach more eyeballs so um, that people can kind of uh, ask questions and, you know, get to know us a bit before making the purchase. Great. Tunga and Kristen, I just sent you an email to connect you, so it should be in your inbox already. Um, Thanks, Tomo. <laughs> The okay, Min, do you want to ask your question? You had your hand up um, virtually. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm really, really appreciate for your work. Um, I'm a product, um, I'm a cloud pad producer in Vietnam. So um, I've been looking for biodegradable, biodegradable product um, everywhere, and I got a friend introduced me to this program, to, to the uh, section. Um, so in, in Vietnam, we have um, a few storms every year. And then with the COVID uh, period, poverty seemed to become a big challenge to certain rural area that got affected. So um, people has been supplied with, with a disposable pad which is okay, but then uh, looking for biodegradable pet would be much, much um, better. And um, so, I, so I, I see on the chat that you, uh, somebody said you have your own factory. And um, I just wonder how can you, um, could you de describe how, how zero waste, zero plastic in, in the production procedure? I, I feel like at factory level, it's, it's 
would be very hard to, to keep it zero weight. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so in terms of the factory level, part of it is that uh, we are able to uh, source the materials that are biodegradable and compostable, so they're all certified. Uh, so that's one aspect which we take a lot of care to, to do because that's kind of how we develop the product from scratch. Um, and then in terms of the production, uh, so, you know, all of our procedures are like basically as much as possible. We are not bringing in any plastics to our product. Um, and so it's, it's really like only if we have to buy us supplies that are uh, you know, like um, wrapped in plastic essentially, but for shipping purposes, which in some cases it's difficult to tell the other person on the other side, please don't wrap it in the plastic, but we do try our best um, on that front. But other than that, like all the things that we produce and that we are using are all um, biodegradable and compostable. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Min. Um, Kristen, do you want to share your like email or contact details in case any, I'm sure people want have more questions, want to reach out to you in the chat box, maybe you can share whatever uh, mode yeah. is best for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I know we can go on for another half an hour with questions and discussion, um, but unfortunately we're, we're out of time. So we'll wrap it up here. Uh, thanks again for sharing so much and doing so much um Kristen and uh yeah maybe a round of applause for yeah Kristen. thank you Kristen it was really really amazing to hear your story and as Thomas said you tick all the boxes it's like it's really really remarkable the work that you're doing and yeah, I'm happy that we had Ibu Herit here in the call as well and hopefully there is some connection that happens with our students in the future as well and yeah, happy to see like people in Indonesia in Vietnam you know although there was not many people in the call a lot of people interested in what is happening and we're going to be sharing as well uh, in our website so later you can share this conversation yeah with your network and Thank you. Thank you so much, not only for being here today, but especially for the work that you do. It's really, really inspiring. Uh, I'm from Brazil and in Brazil, uh, the president has just banned the, uh, the rights for women to have access to menstruation pads, which is really sad. It makes us feel that we're going backwards and it's just inspiring to see. Uh, the work that you're doing and hoping that one day my country will go in this direction. Maybe you can bring Sadis there to Brazil. That could be another another country after Indonesia, of course, that it's first in the line. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being here as well today. Thank you, Tomo, for always, you know, uh, inspiring, you know, the work that you guys do at Earth Company. It's so important. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Christine. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a beautiful day.